Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm very excited uh, to be talking about this topic. As everybody, everybody who knows me um, knows I've been dancing around USB 800 for a long time. As I know we all have, it's an important topic that's been around for a while. And I wanted to do events or something based on this topic. And given the current state of, of conferences, we decided I decided it would be best to do a series of podcasts. I reach out, reached out to Jeff Hedges, who is an, exp uh, an expert on all of this. And he has agreed to do a three-part series on USP 800. So uh, we're going to be doing them monthly. This is our first one. And our second one is going to be March 10th, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But Jeff, why don't you start and uh, tell us a little bit about, about yourself? Um, okay. I um, own uh, and operate RJ Hedges Associates out of New Florence, Pennsylvania, which is up in the mountains about 55 miles east of Pittsburgh. Our company, uh, we, uh, we work with independent pharmacies nationwide. And what we do is bring all the compliance requirements that a pharmacy needs from uh, DME, pharmacy, Part D, Part B, hazardous drugs, compounding, uh, immunizations, anything that the pharmacy does that requires, uh, <clears throat> anything the pharmacy does that requires uh, policies and procedures, forms, processes, all those things are done uh, with our proprietary software we customize every document to the individual pharmacy. So some of the state boards are getting a little weird. They want to see the actual pharmacy's name on the policies and procedures, as well as the forms. And that's all part of our program. And then we update. So as rules uh, change by any of these multitude of departments and agencies, we're constantly updating our policies and procedures. Uh, it's a detailed process. We have a very um, strict process of writing, editing, um, and posting all our processes. Uh, we have a team of attorneys uh, that when we get into those legal items, we pose that uh, to them and uh, try to get their clarification. For example, with the new, uh, well, uh, with Supreme Court putting in the, uh, CDC uh, COVID and uh, immunization requirements. Uh, there's a requirement in there that's on the what's called the RTS. And it's very, very confusing because we had two different statutes at the same time going through. And so there's one question about whether the pharmacies are involved because of the vaccines and the testing. And there's other requirements bring in OSHA and they don't make sense. So we kicked that back to our attorneys and they've been working on it for over a week. And we haven't got a response yet because I think I found the problem that no one looked at, which is what I do best. So, and then we have a, uh, our staff, most of them are remote um, and we can handle just about any emergency or problem that comes down into an independent pharmacy these days. So it's great for the pharmacy. It's kind of boring at times. Compliance is always boring. And sometimes I'm considered boring or scare tactics. And I never really do. I just tell them what's out there and how we need to prepare and how we have to deal with what we have to deal with to get through this without any fines or penalties or anything else. Great. I, you know, you, you brought up the COVID regulation, and that actually brings me to my very first question, which is our title. Um, how to, uh, Understanding how hazardous drugs are as confusing as the COVID recommendations. Maybe you want to uh, <laughs> elaborate a little bit on that past what you, I mean, is that what you were just referring to, all the contradictory stuff? So is right. that... <clears throat> so with, uh, with hazardous drugs... Uh, COVID is just a confusing thing. Um, and you go to, all you have to do is go to the CDC, look at their website, and it gets confusing and then keeps on getting confusing because it's changing so fast, which is natural for a virus. So, um, and they're trying to put everything in detailed writing for that specific thing, and it just don't work. So hazardous drugs is the exact same way, except it's a little bit more confusing 
because uh, USP 800 came out originally back in, I think it was 2015 was the first time it came out from USP. And it has gone through some revisions. And then it got tied into USP 795 and 797 for the sterile, non-sterile compounding. Uh, when they tied it together, uh, which is all in what they call the USP compendium, uh, then uh, everything started getting a little confusing as far as the new standards. Uh, everything was supposed to go into effect in December of 2000, or Jan uh, July of 2019. Uh, then it was delayed because on the compounding side, there was a major issue between uh, the academics and the uh, people actually doing the work with beyond use dating. And the process got real confusing. So what happened, uh, they pulled it back and they said, okay, we're not doing anything right now. Everything's for information until we get this worked out. Well, that is still going on. And then what happened as it was delayed and delayed, USP 800 actually went into effect, but USP was telling everybody it's for informational purposes only. Okay, that's fine. But then uh, as everything was remand, uh, going through USP, uh, on March 12th, two days before the uh, pandemic was declared, USP said, we can't come to an agreement. We need to remand this back to the um, to the committees and let them work it out. Well, what happened at that point, USP 800 is a standalone. And technically, when that happened, it went back um, into comply or into effect, effective the 12th of March 2020. So all the dates sort of fall together. But anyways, what happened, no one paid attention. We had something more important called COVID and the pandemic, and everybody was getting ready to shut everything down. So no one paid any attention. But the USP kept on saying it's information only, but they added, we are not responsible for what any regulatory agency would do. Hmm. So, so wait, yeah, wait a minute. That that gives me pause. <laughs> um, and I also want to mention to everybody that they can put uh, stuff in the chat and we'll answer any questions. But so they're saying it's just information, but any regulatory, is this the way it is? So here's a question. Is this the way it is for all USP stuff? Um, because I'm a little confused about the inspection thing, because I was told that it was informational and I've had conversations about inspections and who and who's doing the inspections and things like that. So, yes, what do we need? I guess that's what you're here to tell us is what do we know, need to know about that? Yeah. OK, so. Um, I know I just confused the question. So yes. the inspection, no, wanna, so wanna, how can wanna, an organization say they're just informational and mm -hmm. but they're not going to be responsible for any inspection agency? I believe that's what you said, right? Yes, yes. Um, I had to get my my thoughts back together on this because US uh, USP issues out their compendium rules, which is all the USC, uh, USP standards and guidelines. But mm -hmm. in the very beginning, it refers back to a CFR for compliance requirements as far as a regulatory portion within the United States. But the, the compendium is issued for the entire planet. So each country gets to decide what they want to do. But in the United States where we're at, um, USP is cautioning everybody, this is only for information. But what happens is, Every state has its own rules and their own guidelines. And at, at the beginning of this, they all said, okay, we're going to wait, hold back. But then we started seeing uh, last year, some states starting to add USP 800 to their inspection checklist from the state board. Initially, it was just questions. Do you have policies and procedures? Do you have assessment of risks? Do you have... Uh, all the proper counting tools and everything. They asked all these questions. And what happened was um, I panicked a lot of people. And the board was just, those boards were just trying to assess 
if the pharmacies were actually working towards compliance. And then towards the end of 2021, then we started having more boards get involved at the state level, and they started adding the requirements for USP 800 as part of their state board inspection, making it mandatory. Uh, so we have that going on. So that's where a lot of confusion is. Do I apply? Is it applicable? Does it not apply? Um, it, it, it's complicated, but it's really not. It's just confusing. Um, so I, I just also want to pause you there. Do you think that all states then will eventually adopt regulation on USP 800? I mean, so it sounds like right now you can look at your individual state and see it, what they're they're doing. But but it just makes sense for every, I mean, I guess it just makes sense anyway. Everybody should be adopting this. And is it just a matter of time when all the states make it uh, part of the, re the uh, uh, regulatory or part of all the regulations? Yes, actually, for the enforcement portion of USP 800 for retail and long term care pharmacies specifically. The state pharmacy boards are the regulators. When we move into compounding, sterile, and non-sterile, we still have the state boards, but we then add in the FDA and some other agencies, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that are coming in and they're adding those items in it at this time as well. So just to be clear, this isn't then um, an F FDA is not is is not inspecting for this, it's the state pharmacy boards. Yes, FDA only expects sterile pharmacies right now. Sterile okay. Pharmacy. Okay, and I just wanted to address another thing in regard because you mentioned SOPs, and I know that you uh, you guys also you know deal a lot. So, I guess does that mean everybody has to start rewriting their SOPs or start really paying attention to their SOPs for hazardous waste? Uh, well, yes, yeah, everybody has that? policies and procedures, and in most cases, a lot of pharmacies don't have policies and procedures. They may have a document from years ago uh, when a state board inspection happens. A lot of times they're calling their counterparts in the area. Hey, do you have a policy and procedure on disposal? Do you have a policy and procedure on bloodborne pathogen? Uh, a whole host of items. And uh, in the past, pharmacies, they just dealt with what they had to do with and they would write things down. But now we have guidelines, we have standards. We have insurance carriers with their policy, our, uh, their standards, and the pharmacies now have to have a full set of documents of policies and procedures. In some cases, when we move into hazardous drugs, there's SOPs, and sometimes there's a question between what's the difference between an SOP and a policy and procedure. Policy and procedure is more rigid. It follows a statute, uh, a regulation, a rule, or whatever it may be. And they are designed to be stringent as far as how they're written and put together. An SOP is what that individual pharmacy will do as far as this act. So I'm going to do A, B, and C, and D together. So if you put that in a policy and procedure, it makes you very strict. You can't move anything. And nothing happens uh, in an order in pharmacy. So if they change... And instead of doing A, B, C, and D, they change it. They're going to do A, D, C, and B. If they put that in their uh, SOP, it's fine. If you put it in a policy procedure and they deviate, then you're in violation of your policy procedure. And everybody always gets in trouble because they did not follow their policy and procedure. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. So uh, what's next then with USP 800? The next is just getting ready. Uh, if you have not started, you have to start now. State boards will change your policy, uh, their regulations or update their inspection requirements. You may or may not find out either through the state board or through your state association. The fact is USP 800 is not going to go away. It's here. It's going to be here tomorrow and next year and for forever. So we have to learn to deal with it. And it's not complicated that, uh, once we get into it, but there are just processes we'll do. And we'll talk about that in the second and third segment.
Did I lose you, Vivian? Yes. 